Welcome everybody. Uh, this is Bob Hollis with Mobius Intelligent Systems and I'm seeing some familiar names on the roster. So great to have you back. Uh, some of you have participated in my classes before and it looks like there's some plenty of uh, new names as well. So thank you all for being here. Um, just quickly wanted to point out that these are all hosted by California Capital. Um, and I, I do these uh, as a volunteer just to help out the community because I've uh, been where you are probably. I started uh, several companies of my own, started them from scratch with no funding <laughs> and by myself and uh, turned them into something that's uh, made things work out pretty well. But I know a lot of you are, are doing that as well through California Capital. And so I'd always invite you to come back and take a look at all of the resources available to help you do that and additional workshops as well. Uh, today, we're gonna to be talking about free and open source software. Oh, and I should mention, um, before the end of the meeting, I'm gonna send you a link to download a PDF that has a, a form that you need to complete to turn back into California Capital. Uh, it's an evaluation form. It gives us information for how to improve these sessions. But very importantly for California Capital is they get matching funds for each hour that I donate. And so uh, they get matching funds from the SBA that helps keep these programs going and keep California Capital going. Uh, so please be sure to do that and let me know if there's anything you think we could improve. So uh, today again, we're gonna be talking about open source software. And a lot of people don't know what that is or what is uh, good or bad about open source. So we'll go through it. I've got a couple of videos to show to get you started on the concept. And we're also gonna do some demos. Uh, in the beginning though, just to, so you understand some of the tools you have available, you'll see that there's a question panel on your GoToWebinar panel. So if you have any questions at any time throughout the webinar, please submit those. And I'll try to keep my eye on the question panel and answer those as we go along. And one of the things I like to ask at the beginning of the class is to think about what type of software you currently use that you're paying for and um, what you're paying the most for. And let's see if we can find a free and open source replacement option. And those are available for the vast majority of software applications out there. Just a lot of people aren't aware that they exist. And there are also some uh, mixed understandings about open source software in terms of uh, security, reliability, et cetera. So some people hesitate to use it because they think open source means it's not as good as something that's closed source, if you will, or proprietary. So we'll talk about that as well and show a couple of videos uh, that emphasize those points and explain it better than I could from uh, Richard Stallman, who created the free software uh, movement and others uh, as recently as last year talking about the latest and greatest apps that they like for free song. And that way you don't have to hear my dull voice for uh, two hours straight without a little bit of uh, breaking it up. So uh, the general agenda today is we'll talk a little bit about intro and background. We're gonna go through some open source software and talk about content management systems, which are, are good to use for websites, um, social media tools, uh, trends and metrics, and a lot of that obviously is free. And then uh, creating an efficient workflow and uh, getting good return on your investment, and then tools and resources for participants. And I should mention every time I say social media is free, it's not really free, it's just that you're the product, you're not the customer. So you're not paying to use social media uh, directly, but they use your data and they sell it to marketing firms that use that data. So that's their revenue model. And uh, you need to keep in mind that you're the product, not the customer when you're dealing with social media platforms. A uh, little bit on my background. I'm the founder of a few companies. There's actually been a, another one since the Mobius Network. We're now Mobius Intelligent Systems, um, working on the next step of the work we've been doing, which has been doing uh, social media websites and that sort of thing for a lot of people for about 10 years. And we've recently, in the last two years, evolved into artificial intelligence 
intelligence and machine learning, predictive analytics, and we create fully integrated systems that encompass websites, social media, news letters, uh, any type of outreach system that you currently have. Uh, we integrate it all into one system so that it all works together. Uh, for example, one of my clients is a a group of 26 cities in Southern California focused on recycling and we can create a post, put it on the website. And when we do that, that post automatically populates a newsletter and goes out to uh, 26 Facebook pages, uh, one for each of the communities, in addition to Twitter accounts and LinkedIn accounts. And you can do that so that it goes out to all types of social media. And when it goes into the newsletter, it, uh, it can the newsletter can go out to different groups of subscribers based on the category of information. So it's a pretty comprehensive system, which happens to be all built on free and open source software. Um, so the Mobius network was uh, primarily technology. Carnegie Partners was a national executive recruiting firm that I launched in Chicago, Illinois. And within three years, we were the largest in the metals industry across the country and then started branching out into other fields and uh, grew pretty significantly to the point within within four years, we were in 26 cities. Uh, I was also a board member of the National Recycling Coalition, who's uh, still a customer, a founding board member of the U.S. Zero Waste Business Council, which created the, the zero waste system that's now part of the LEED program. So, for example, the Sacramento Kings New Arena is, a, I forget whether it's LEED Gold or LEED Platinum now, uh, but our zero waste system went into that building, and it's now going into every building and every new building in India, China, and Canada this year, um, in addition to, I believe, all California publicly funded buildings. But I didn't get paid anything for that. That was just a, a fun project to try to help make things a little better. Uh, I served as a board advisor and a board member for the California Resource Recovery Association, um, Rock the Earth, and Headcount, and Positive Legacy, which are all nonprofits uh, based in the music industry. And then I uh, served on the development committee for Earth Island Institute for about 15 years. Uh, educational background is uh, marketing, industrial management, information systems at Carnegie Mellon, where I happen to be um, right now. I'll be here for three weeks uh, putting on a, some programs for them. And then uh, grad school at University of Chicago, uh, focused on business, B2B marketing, and grad school at Harvard for environmental management, and then a little more learning at Stanford, but just continuous education on uh, internet and social media technologies. So I do now what's uh, what I call just-in-time learning because the world changes so fast and there's so much knowledge right at hand. I don't think I'll ever go back to complete a degree, but I'll certainly never quit learning because there's so much to do. But most of the information you need these days, you can find yourself if you know what to look for. Um, so the Mobius Network and Mobius Intelligence Systems uh, mostly works with groups that have some type of public benefit mission. And so I just like to see good things happen. So if any of you need help with anything, don't hesitate to reach out, and uh, I'll see what I can do to help you out. Most of our clients, again, are nonprofits, recycling organizations, uh, product storage groups, community groups, government agencies, schools, values-driven companies, and uh, music community uh, several Grammy Award winners to have been clients. And of course, I don't mention that uh, for 20 years, I served main corporate companies with uh, our recruiting services. So what is open source software? Uh, a lot of people wonder what that means, and they also equate free with open source, which isn't always the case. So the difference is that open source software can be sold, but you have more of a, of a license to use it, and you have freedom to see the code and edit the code to make it do whatever you want to do. And the movement all started back when I was an undergrad, and um, one of my professors got a, got a copier from, I believe it was Xerox, and they couldn't get the copier print function or to work quite the way it was supposed to. And so Xerox sent the copier to him to work on it. Well, a guy at MIT named uh, Richard Stallman heard about the problem, and he came down to Carnegie Mellon and visited with the professor and said, I, I can help you with this. I think I know exactly what's wrong. I just need to see the code, and I can fix it, and then send it back. 
And <laughs> he was shocked when the professor said, well, I'm sorry, but I can't show you the code. And he said, what do you mean you can't show me the code? Because up to that point, most programmers were scientists and they considered code to be open, just like language or scientific tools or formulas. So when you're a scientist and an academic and you make some grand discovery about something, you want to share that with the world so the rest of the world can benefit from the knowledge you've acquired and the discoveries you've made. And when he ran into this with software, well, he said, well, I can't show it to you. And he said, why? And he said, well, Xerox told me not to. And he said, they aren't letting anybody see the code. And they, he said, no. And, he, and they said, they actually said your name specifically. So he went back to MIT where he was working on uh, Unix projects. And he wanted to create something that would replicate Unix and be modular, but free and open source that anybody could use anywhere. And that was the general foundation for what ultimately became Linux once uh, Linus Torvalds uh, invented the, created the kernel. And then and the rest of the system, what went into it was from what Richard Stallman and his team at MIT had been working on. And that created Linux. And these days, uh, Linux is what runs the vast majority of the internet in terms of uh, websites and hosting. The, the, almost every website that you see, or at least well over 50% of them, are running on Linux servers, which is all free open source software. So a report came out that uh, the consumers save about 60 billion per year by using free and open source. And again, those things aren't completely um, in one circle where you know if it's if it's open source, it's free. But there is a lot of it that's free. Then there's a foundation called FOSS, the Free and Open Source Software Society, uh, that promotes exactly that, free and open source software that's free as in free beer, uh, which you'll hear more of when we listen to Richard Stallman in a little while. So uh, some examples of open source software is Open, open Office, which has been forked and now it's Office Libre that has been for a few years. And, Office Libre is a replacement for Microsoft Office that you can do just about anything with. And in fact, it has features that Microsoft Office doesn't have, and it's all completely free. Uh, GIMP, which is a, a, a graphic information uh, image manipulation program, is a free substitute for Photoshop that probably has everything you need in it for anything that you might want to do. Um, Scribe is a, like a page layout document uh, type system where you can uh, create documents and Linux we just talked about. So before we jump into the specifics, I'd like to give you a, a little bit more um, information on what what Richard Stallman has to say about this. And again, this is the founder of the free software movement. And if any of you have seen the movie Independence Day with uh, Will Smith, where the aliens come down, and they uh, they eventually take the president to an underground lab, and he meets a scientist there that's working with the aliens. Uh, that scientist supposedly was based on Richard Stallman. So if you think he looks vaguely familiar, it's probably from that movie. So uh, with that, we're going to watch a, a TED Talk here for a few minutes with uh, Richard Stallman.
Okay, so that was Richard Stallman. So he's uh, obviously quite an evangelist for uh, free and open source software and talks about the four freedoms. And in some of his other talks, he talks about freedom and free as in free to change the code and do what you want with it uh, versus free beer, which would be Libre versus gratis. And the reason that's important and coming back to why open source software is actually more secure than proprietary software is because anybody can see the code, it's uh, transparent. It's the ultimate transparency. So if there's malware in code somewhere, any decent programmer, and sometimes it's sophisticated, it takes more than uh, you know just somebody who knows a little bit of HTML, but you can look at the code and figure out if there's a problem in there and if it's doing something it shouldn't be doing. If that code is compiled in a way that you can't access it as a programmer, then you don't know what's in there. And uh, there could be, you know, just like some of the leaks that came out with security breaches, where it turned out to be an employee who, before they left a the company, say, dumped all of their clients' uh, personal information out on the dark web. Uh, the same thing can happen inside a company where you have a, a coder working for a company that has some malintent and they can bury a backdoor or a bug of some kind within the software code. And if that's compiled in a way that you can't look at it, and i.e. not open source, then you don't know what's in there and you can't fix it. And I have another class on cybersecurity where we go into a lot more of that, but that's a, I'll just have to mention that anything that you ever do with software, make sure you apply the latest updates because 90% of the time, those updates also have to do with security. So uh, I'm looking here for any questions and just want to remind you, uh, anything that you're currently paying for, any type of software that you're currently paying for, uh, please submit a question, submit something in the question box if you would like to find a, a free replacement for that. And we'll see what we can do right here on the call. And one of the, uh, one of the good sources for that is open is the SourceForge, and we'll go through the presentation a little bit, and then we'll jump into some of these things live online, and you can see what all is available there. So SourceForge is a great great place, as I said, to find software. You can go in and do a search on anything that you want, and it has thousands and thousands of, of free programs available that will work for with, uh, Mac, PC, or Linux machines. Here's an example of uh, open source financial software. So rather than uh, doing something like paying for uh, QuickBooks or something along those lines, you could set up your own with something like uh, GNU Cash. Commerce software. So if any of you are in my web development series, we're gonna be using something called WooCommerce there, which is a free software for e-commerce that's running on WordPress, which is also free open source software. And in addition to those, you can see some of them here. Uh, Zencart is pretty popular. Uh, PrestaShop is pretty popular. And there are a lot more platforms coming online. Uh, one of the things that is a, a divider in the world of e-commerce software is whether or not it's uh, SaaS, which is software as a service, or PaaS, platform as a service or you actually get the software itself. So when you get the software itself, you can install it in the, the environment that it works in. So for example, in the case of WooCommerce, we're installing that on a WordPress site and we can do anything we want with that code. So if I put Word, Word, WooCommerce in, and there's a feature that it has that, that uh, or I would like it to have that it doesn't, then I can go look to see if somebody else has already created that feature and add it in, or I can code it myself or have somebody else code it for me. And that's the beauty of it. So even if you thought you need a totally uh, custom system that is way more advanced and does a lot more things than WooCommerce does, you don't have to hire a programmer to code it all the way up to where WooCommerce is and then also write the new features in. What you can do is have that person start with WooCommerce and then just add in the features that you need and make it work the way you want it to. And if that were Microsoft Office, obviously you couldn't do that. 
So you can't open Microsoft Office and say, well, I would like it to, you know, have uh, spinning GIFs that rotate around the page when I'm, somebody's reading it. You know, you can't make Microsoft Office do anything that Microsoft doesn't want it to do. Whereas some of these other programs, you can make them do anything you want them to do because you can open up the code and add anything that you like to it or change it or remove features if you want to. Uh, scheduling software, here are some examples of that. So you can see some of it's even set up there for um, Outlook CalDev Synchronizer. Uh, Gantt projects, if any of you have ever worked on scheduling projects where certain things need to take place in a certain order and they take different amounts of time, uh, what always comes to mind for me is uh, building a house where you have to have, you know, say the electrical and the plumbing and the drywall and the framing and all of that stuff very well coordinated so that they're all done in the right order. Uh, again, Gantt chart is typically what has been used historically for working through those engineering projects. Uh, open Office. Now, this is, I would I would say Office Libre is really the way you want to go. And it's not also known as Office Libre. Those are actually separate forks. And since they forked, Office Libre has uh, advanced more and taken the lead. And that's a pretty reliable platform. And we'll take a look at that in a minute. We'll actually look online. But you can get an idea of some of the things that it does here. You can do text documents, spreadsheets, presentations, uh, drawings, database, formulas, and all of that without paying anybody for software. It's all completely free and downloadable. There's an example for open office text, which, as you can see, is uh, just looks a lot like a Word document. And here's some examples of things that you can do also uh, because it's open source. So more than 100 million downloads so far for open office. And you can just, uh, in your mind, replace that with Office Libre. Uh, they're pretty much the same thing and accomplish the same thing, but they're slightly different platforms now. But the idea is to see if I want to learn more about it. There's plenty of training. I can download it. I can go get assistance. I want to do more so they have extensions that you can use. I want to participate in OpenOffice. And now what that means is that there are a lot of uh, different templates and things already in the OpenOffice library that you can use. So let's say I run a, I don't know, a trucking company. And there's a certain inventory pattern that and items that are consistent across all trucking companies. Well, I can create a temp, uh, a spreadsheet or something like that that calculates out anything I need to do my inventory and ordering. And then I can put that spreadsheet online and let other people download it to use for free. So the whole community shares. And you can even, again, let's say I own a company, a trucking company, and I want to use something like that, but it's not quite what I want. I can still download it and start with that and then just make the changes so I don't have to start from scratch. So Part of the idea around free and open source is about sharing with the community and having the community as a whole uh, profit or gain from the software as much as possible. So the in economics, you might call it a, a Pareto optimal solution, a, a solution that helps the most people uh, to, the, to the greatest degree. And that's the one you would go with if you want uh, optimal social value for it. Here's an example of some of the extensions. Um, I remember OpenOffice had PDF before Microsoft included it. So you can pay for Microsoft Office and not be able to save something as a PDF. But if you were using OpenOffice, you could save items as a PDF. Here are some examples of templates. So there's a resume, for example. So I can download resume templates, calendar. We'll take a look at some of these a bit later. Web content management systems. So we've we talked uh, briefly about WordPress. We're going to look at that a little more in a minute. Uh, Drupal and Joomla are both also free and open source web content management systems. But before we go too far into uh, web content, I also want to play a brief video for you uh, from somebody who's reviewing his best software choices 
from uh, 2018, just last year. And it will uh, give you an idea of some of the apps he uses, and it'll show you some of the things that you can do with it and why it's useful. And a couple in there I didn't even know about, and they uh, they uh, can be very useful for replacing things like OneNote. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get this uh, short video started, and we'll continue from there. And then we'll go online and look at some live examples of how some of this stuff works and what you can do with it.
Okay, so that was uh, uh, obviously a review of some of the latest and greatest open source software out there. And if, again, if any of you have any questions or specific requests for certain types of software, let me know and we'll look for something and see what we can find right here in the class. Um, moving on through the presentation, we're talking about web content management systems. But, you know, as this uh, presentation, we're, we can go through the PDF, but I've got some other pages up here loaded. And I think it might be better to take a look at at some of the stuff live online. So what we talked about before and what you saw was the different ways that you can, uh, some of the different software you can use. And one of the best places to find it is SourceForge. So I'm gonna just randomly pick something here. Um, let's say I want something for photo editing. So I'll just type in photos here and see what comes up. Oops, that a panel in my way, excuse me. Well, this is obviously a, a bit broader than what I was looking for, but you can see what how you can narrow it down as well. So let's say that I want things for uh, Windows and something that does multimedia. in a desktop environment. And you can see already all of the different things that come up here. And some of it you're gonna get, you know, see some uh, reviews that I wouldn't always trust. I mean, people that put software together also use this as a marketing platform. Uh, but you can go down and, and choose all the different things that you're looking for and see what comes up and available. But there's a good chance that anything that you're working on has a free and open source version that you can use. So SourceForge is a great place for that. Here's another one, this is uh, Fosbytes. And Fosbytes is a free open source software. That's what the FOS stands for. And they uh, they focus on free as in not just Libre, but also gratis. So it doesn't cost anything either. And if you take a look at some of the things they mentioned, one is of course Firefox. Uh, browsers are pretty important. Somebody said they can't hear me here. Is anyone else having a uh, sound issue? Um, if someone could please type into the question box and just let me know if you can hear me or not. Okay, uh, thank you, Trina. I appreciate that. Um, uh, yep, and others are, are replying that they can as well. Uh, so, uh, Danielle, you might want to check your volume on your speakers or see if perhaps you've muted your microphone. Um, if you could, please uh, just do that and then get back to me. I'll see if I can help you further. But I'm hearing back from a lot of other people that they can can hear me fine, so it must be something on your end. Uh, anyway, so thank you everybody. So we're looking through here and uh, Firefox is important and we're gonna talk more about browsers here for a minute because a lot of people don't know that there'd be any difference. And I like Google, uh, Google I'm a Google friendly. Uh, my daughter did a couple internships there and I've got a, a lot of friends that work there and some that are pretty early on, like some of the earliest employees. And Google's fine if you know all about the privacy features and what you can turn on and turn off. But you also have to realize that they make their money from advertising as well and collecting data and they made Chrome. So Chrome is free and open source, which is great. And so is Android for phones. But the, well, I should say the only, but the difference between that and Firefox is Firefox is owned by the Mozilla organization, which is a nonprofit. So in Mozilla's case, they want to make the best product for you. You're not the product with them. You're the customer. And with just about every other browser out there, you are the product and not the customer. So they're doing what they need to do for their purposes and for the purposes of their advertisers and meeting the the requirements that they think they need to meet uh, to not be panned in the public for what they're doing and not get in trouble with Congress or regulators. So they wanna walk right up to that line and collect as much information as they can 
well, perhaps giving you some options to go in and say, no, don't follow me, don't track me, don't do any of this, um, if you can find those options. And I know where they are. And like I said, I'm comfortable with that. But most people don't think about it. So they open up their browser and uh, they use the browser everywhere and they don't realize that they're being tracked all over the place. So there are a lot of new tools out for that. And we'll take a look at Brave in a minute because that is something pretty cool that was a Chrome offshoot uh, started by Google people who said the same thing. And uh, a lot of the people that work at Google are pretty cool. And they look at this and say, wait a minute, this isn't right. So they, they forked off Brave and uh, built that out to work on the Chrome technology, but without any of the advertising and tracking going on. And we'll look at Brave in a minute. And uh, they're just showing Firefox here, regular Firefox. I happen to like Firefox Developer Edition, which I suggest all of you download, whether you're a developer or not, just because it's got some cool tools that are more advanced than regular Firefox. Uh, so you can download that for free. Uh, Chrome is also an alternative to Microsoft Edge, but we've talked about that, and I think there, there are some advantages and disadvantages there as well. VLC is really cool as an alternative to Windows Media Player, and I like things that work cross-platform. I have PCs, I have Macs, and I have a Linux machine. Then I have an Android device. So I have all these devices running on different operating systems, that I kind of like to know my software so that I don't have to learn different software, even the user interface and all the options for a, each machine that I'm on. So by using something like VLC, I can use the same media player on Linux, Mac, PC, and not have any problems. I know how to use it. I know what it does. Um, and it works pretty well. Uh, DC++ is just open source file sharing client. I don't think uh, many people are going to have use for that, but the way you can think about that is it's a way to share files across the internet uh, with other, other users. Peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, or P2P is what a lot of people call it. Um, here's a torrent downloader. BitTorrent is used for a lot of music files. Uh, GIMP, we're going to take a look at in a minute. That's the uh, Photoshop replacement. LibreOffice we've talked about, and we'll look at that in more detail. 7-Zip is just a zipped file extractor. So if you ever have uh, one of those folders that you said will, um, that you said will, you know, will, it looks like it's compressed, it's got a zipper on it, then this is software you would use to open that up, and that's all free. And I see a couple of questions that came in. Uh, what was the name of the Firefox app you said was more complete than regular Firefox? And the second is, will you share a list of these apps, or should we, we be writing all of the apps down? Well, uh, yes, we'll take a look at Firefox in just a second, and I'll go deeper into that to answer your question. And in regards to writing this down, I am recording this session, and I'll provide each of you with a link to the recording. So you might want to take some notes, but um, yeah, what I'll, what I'll commit to doing is also sharing a file with you. I, I will list all these out and I'll send them out to everybody who's attended today. And so you don't have to worry too much about taking notes. Uh, I know sometimes it's hard to take notes on one subject and listen to what's being talked about at the same time. So just uh, since the question's been asked, why don't we jump out here and we'll look at Firefox. So you'll notice here I use DuckDuckGo. Uh, this is just a page background. It loads up a different Google map every time I load. But you see the icon here is DuckDuckGo. And my home page is DuckDuckGo. I'm a big believer in privacy. And along the lines of Firefox, uh, you can see that DuckDuckGo's motto is the search engine that doesn't track you. I highly encourage the use of DuckDuckGo. If you've ever had things going on where you're you know, watching something on Netflix and you start to type in a first name in a search and suddenly the name of the actress in the movie you're watching comes on, you'll get some idea of the depth of the cyber <laughs> cyber espionage that goes on all around you every day. And again, we have a separate workshop on that, so I'm not going to get too deep into it. But, but you should know that a lot of time, all of your devices are talking to each other and other people's devices all around you all the time, and you don't even know it. Um, Bluetooth, for example, uh, just had a very 
a significant flaw exposed recently uh, to where the best recommendation is to do not turn on Bluetooth. <laughs> don't turn it on when you don't need it. So, you know, if you sync with your Fitbit or your Apple Watch or something like that, turn it on, sync, and then turn it off again. And uh, I put mine on in my car because it, it'll synchronize with my radio and I could use the phone hands free and that sort of thing. But then I turn it off as soon as I disconnect from those things because uh, anybody who knows what they're doing or went to the last DEF CON can uh, hack any device with Bluetooth on it pretty easily now. And again, we thought that was pretty safe uh, until very recently. So there'll be more changes coming out. And if you see an update for your Bluetooth software, uh, make sure that you accept that upload. So uh, let's take a look here. So DuckDuckGo is what I use for all my searches. You can also set it as the default. Now you notice I am using Chrome here, but I know what my privacy settings are and have uh, delved into them significantly. And I've set DuckDuckGo as the default search engine and my home page. So if I want to come in here and I could just type in Firefox, but a Firefox developer edition. And that's what I was talking about to answer that question of what was the name of the Firefox app. So Firefox developer edition, you'll see here, it's called uh, also very fast. So these uh, browsers also can tend to leapfrog each other in terms of speed. And until recently, I was using Chrome because it was just much faster than Firefox, even though I, I like the concept behind Firefox better. With the Firefox Quantum that just came out, that gap's been closed significantly. So there are actually some performance tests where Firefox Developer Edition is faster. But you can download it right here. And uh, let's see if it lays a list of the features out. Well, it just wants me to download now. But I'm sure there's someplace up here where it talks about the differences and the more advanced features that you get with Developer Edition. It works pretty much the same in terms of uh, browsing the web. You're not gonna notice much differences there, uh, but as a developer myself, or if I wanna see what's going on behind the site I'm looking at, all of these different features are built right in. So let's say uh, there I could, for example, pull up this, well, here I'm gonna pull up. Here's Firefox Developer Edition opening up. And now let's say I go to the California Capital site. All right, now this happens to be a site that I also work on. Now let's say that there was something in there and I was having an issue and I couldn't figure out how to change this code or anything down here. Like, I don't know where it came from. I don't know which program is generating it or where I can fix it. Um, I can, since I'm in Firefox Developer Edition, I can right click and just say inspect. And now you see all this that opens up down here. I can hover over anything and choose the, this layout's a little bit different. Here we go. I usually have the layout up on the top. I'm on a different computer today. So I can find this and I can see the exact settings of it. And then I can go in and see where all of this is. So now I know that this is in the element code right here. And I can even see what it would look like if I wanted to change it. So let's say I wanted that to be 90% uh, or 80% instead of 100%. I can do something like this. And you can see it made the change right there. Uh, I can do that with any site even a site that I don't own. Let's say something like amazon.com. All right, suppose I wanted to change something here just to see what it would look like. Well, that's probably an image. These are images, but uh, whatever. I'm just going to jump in there. So I'm going to say inspect element. And now I can highlight anything that I want to see. First get the inspector there. So here I can see this image, and I can see the width and height, right? Now let's say I wanted to change something or see what it would look like if it were changed. I can come in here and hover over any of it. And then I could go in and change uh, anything that I want here and see what that would look like. So here's a font size of 13. Let's make that 
33. Oops. See that? So I just changed the Amazon site, didn't I? <laughs> Not really. I'd be the best hacker in the world if I could do that. Um, so all we did was change the way the browser recognizes it and renders it. Uh, so what I could do is if I wanted to mess around with code to see what needs to be fixed on the back end, I can use that tool in Firefox Developer Edition. Then I can, uh, if I set it up right, I can actually edit the code right there and save it to my files. And that would be, that would take care of the problem. Or I can just copy and paste it and update the site to take a look at what that's doing. So that's why I like uh, Firefox Developer Edition. It's faster and it has those types of tools that regular Firefox doesn't have. Uh, you can see here, you can look at storage, memory, performance, um, anything that you want, style editor. So you can play around with websites and, and uh, if you're the, also the admin on the site, you can see what you like on the front end, then you just add it to the back end code. Okay, uh, so I think I answered that question pretty thoroughly. Um, let's look at what else we have out here on. Oh, and by the way, I should point out, uh, we were going to point this out anyway here. This is um, the this site. I'm going to send a link out through the chat box. So for right now, I might move some of this content to the California Capital website. But until I do, if I do, you can come to this link bakersfieldrecycles.com and this is where we've done a lot of work on classes and I'll add the I'll add the recording up here under the sessions recording page and also down here there's a training evaluation form so I'm going to send that link out as well and this is the one that I was talking about is uh, important to return so that we can uh, know if you know what we can do to make this class better so give us any feedback and also if you send that in to this address scanacapital.org and i think we're going to have a new address for that for um for sarah uh, but for now that's the one i'll give you if you know sarah and have her address feel free to send that to her uh, but otherwise sophia would be fine as well then that's what they use to get uh, reimbursement for the time that I donate from uh, SBA. So that's important just to know where you can uh, where you can go to get more information, and that's where I'll, I'll put up the recording. Uh, virtual box. There's probably not many people on here that would have a good use for that. Uh, Tor browser. If you've you've heard of the dark web, I'm sure, and what a lot of people don't realize that the majority of the internet is not visible to the public, but you can't get to it from a regular browser. It's uh, you need what's, what they call an onion router, and basically Tor is it. So Tor was created by the U.S. Navy originally to help dissidents in foreign countries who were trying to organize and overthrow. Um, I don't know what you call those. Just governments that the U.S. did not want to support would probably be the best way to put it. Uh, so they would allow dissidents to use this software to organize. And then a lot of other people started using it, including a lot of people in the United States. And it's primarily to provide anonymity, anonymity uh, to people who are using the Internet. So you can, um, you can go in through Tor and you can get to these dark websites if you know where to go. I'm not going to encourage it. I go there just to do cybersecurity research. But if you don't know what you're doing, you can end up with uh, more trouble than you hoped for. But Tor can be used for anonymity as a browser just to go to any other website as well. So if you'd like Tor, um, that's easy to download and also free. And uh, and then you can uh, you can use it as well for anything that you need to use it for. Uh, FileZilla is a great FTP file if you if you need to use it, um, and it's it can be used for uh, communicating with websites without using 
uh, using cPanel or a file manager or for moving big files around. So FTP stands for File Transfer Protocol. And uh, that can be a, a substitute for the file manager because it can uh, it can upload larger files without interruption. Thunderbird is a great email choice. Now, I, I do have a caveat with this, as with all email. The traditional email was something where you have it installed on your computer, and then it goes out and collects your email from the mail server and pulls it all into your laptop or your desktop. And that's what Thunderbird does as well. But the problem with that is you're downloading all this stuff onto your machine. So I'm a big fan of webmail myself. And you can often get webmail for free from even your uh, domain registrar. So if you register a domain through GoDaddy, for example, you can set up webmail where you can log in on GoDaddy to read your email. And you don't have to download it to your machine. And that's important because you don't want to be filling up your hard drive with things. And you don't want to be downloading things from the, the internet that you don't know what they are. That's how a lot of machines get infected. Uh, Media Cla Player Classic, I've not used. I usually use the VCL or VLC, and that one's free also. Um, KeyPass is an open source password manager. I'm personally using Norton for that because I, I have a Norton security um, subscription that covers like everything they offer for 10 devices, and it also happens to be free. So I highly recommend that as well. Um, even Norton would be fine, and that's free. So Norton Password Manager works with any browser, and you can uh, have different passwords for every single site. The one thing, of course, is you've got all that hidden behind one password. So you need to have one very strong password that isn't likely to be hacked uh, that you use to get in and open your uh, password manager. But once that password manager is open, It'll remember and help you strengthen your passwords on all of your other sites. Uh, mine, I even have set up to go in and automatically update my password, change my password monthly for both LinkedIn and Facebook automatically. And then it updates my password manager when it does it. So I don't have to remember what they are or go in and change it myself all the time. And then, uh, well, I guess that's the last one they have here. So we'll take a look at some of these things. Uh, GitHub wanted me to log in, and I'm on a machine I'm not usually on. I'm not going to bother with that and checking email. We'll just go straight to GitHub. GitHub is a great place to download any software that you might be looking for. So you can see what all it does. Uh, they have pricing plans, but you don't really need to use that. What you really want to do is just go in and look for the software that you want. Um, so GitHub is a repository, and basically that's where a lot of developers put their software up. And you can go up and download it for free. Uh, you can see all the major organizations that use it, so it's a great place to put content, and a lot of people use it as code archive. Uh, even some software, once it goes offline and isn't available to the public anymore, they'll put it in the GitHub repository if it's open source and let other people come in and keep working off the software. This is LibreOffice that we've talked so much about. So you can see their website's pretty nice, and uh, I can send this link out to people as well. So I'll just copy that. And if you're seeing things come up in your chat box, what you can do when those links come up, just click on them, and they'll open up in your browser, and then bookmark them. And as you can see, if you're looking at my screen, I like to use folders for multiple reasons. One, I do a lot of these webinars, and I record a lot of webinars, and I don't want the, to expose all the different software that I use, because then even if hackers see that, they have some idea of how they might be able to get into my machine one way or another. So I hide things in folders, and I also am allowed uh, able to organize things better. So for example, if for this class, you might create a folder with the title of the class. And then as you create bookmarks, drag them into that folder so that you know where to find them the next time. 
And if you do it this way across the top, then you can go deep vertically. So like these are all my client folders on specific projects. I have day plan folders. Uh, this is all for design. These are all development tools. Uh, all my Google products. So you can see I can hierarchically find everything up here pretty easily. Um, but I can be infinitely expandable as well without running out of space on the bookmark bar. So LibreOffice, you can see here, you can just uh, download it from here. They have options for uh, Windows and uh, Mac, Linux, all of the above. And I'm going to go ahead and do that because I'm on a new machine and I'm going to be needing the software at some point here pretty soon. And you can donate if you like. Yeah, I probably should, but I won't take the time to do that right now. And this is a, this should be downloading on its own. So I'm just going to let that run. Actually, you know, I probably shouldn't do it now. I'm going to cancel that. So just so we don't have uh, any problems with the bandwidth. So another uh, important and useful uh, tool is GIMP. It's a funny name, but it's a fantastic program. So it's been around for a long time. You can see it was just recently updated here in June of 2019. So they're keeping it up to date. It's a free cross-platform cross image editor. So it works with Linux, Microsoft, Windows. So again, it's nice because you can put it on all of your machines and it works the same everywhere. Uh, graphic design, photography, illustration. It provides you just about everything that most people would use in uh, in something like Photoshop or Adobe products, only it's all free. And I hope my daughter doesn't hear this because she, uh, after finishing her PhD, went to work for Adobe and now she's running the Lightroom product for human computer inter interaction uh, in the UX design. But anyway, she's, she likes free software too. So you can see you can use it for photos. Uh, you can create original art with it, create graphic design elements, and all of this is completely free. And you can see here that they also uh, promote software like Scribus, Inkscape, and Swatchbooker. So Scribus, if you take a look at that, is open source desktop publishing. So something similar to using um, Illustrator would probably be the closest. Illustrator or uh, not Premiere, Adobe Premiere does movies. There's Illustrator and InDesign are the two Adobe products that this would replace. And then as they mentioned here, there's also Inkscape. And this is drawing software that's also completely free. So this would be closer to Illustrator, while Scribus would be closer to InDesign and Adobe products. And Swatchbooker, I don't know about. So I want to see what that is, too. Oh, that's cool. So Swatchbooker looks like it reads color swatches from documents. So say you were in the middle of making a website or designing something, you can uh, pull all the colors out and get uh, exact codes, exact text codes for all the colors that are made up and that are used in that document. And then you can use those exact same colors to replicate the style. Here's uh, KDEN Live, and this was the video editing software that was shown in our last uh, video that we watched. And you can do just about anything with this as well. So if you have a video file, and say you want to trim it or you want to add some overlays to it to you know put a title and date maybe old family videos you took a video on your vacation with your phone and then you upload it to your computer and you wanted to do some more sophisticated editing with it uh, speed it up slow it down add overlays you can do all of that with kden live instead of adobe premiere pro well adobe premiere pro is used to make hollywood uh, grade movies so uh, blockbuster style. So I, I think, for example, it was used for um, a bunch of the recent Disney movies, I know. And it used to be Apple's uh, Apple's movie making software was pretty much the standard in Hollywood, but it's changed a bit in the last few years and Adobe Premiere's pretty much taken over the market now for that. 
but you don't need anything that sophisticated for your general home or business video editing. And in that case, KDEN Live could be the way to go. So we also talked about uh, Brave a little bit ago when we were mentioning Firefox. So we'll jump to that too. And this is Brave. Uh, it's just brave.com. Uh, I've heard good things and I haven't tried it. So I, I thought about it you know, every time I teach this course, I've been doing it over the last few years. I want to find the latest and greatest stuff to see what it is. I've been reading about Brave on Reddit for a really long time as it was being developed. And it was a, some people from Google who are also kind of free open source software enthusiasts that said there should be a browser out there that doesn't track everybody and that you can use without worrying about that sort of thing, but works fast and smooth and seamlessly. So they created Brave and it's supposed to be advertising free. So you can see right in the middle of the screen, you are not a product. Why use a browser that treats you like one? Enjoy private, secure, and fast browsing with Brave. Now, I also have to give Google credit for letting these people work on this as Google employees because they're basically creating a free product to create their, to uh, replace their employer's product while pointing out flaws in their employer's product. And so uh, it has been spun off, I believe, to um, a private um, or a nonprofit group or affiliation or association. It's not a Google product anymore, I don't think. Um, but that's probably a good thing. So I'm going to leave that one marked myself and come back to it later. So uh, with uh, we also talked a bit about WordPress. And one of the reasons that I do is uh, not everybody has a website. but most people do if they're in business. And if you want to uh, want to know what else you can do with your website, then, oh, I see. <laughs> right, another question that's popped up, an open source alternative to InDesign, and then, uh, then thanks, you just answered the question. Good. And a lot of those things too, uh, a lot of those tools will be developed so that they can open Adobe files. So even if the original file was developed in InDesign, there's a good chance that I, I can't speak to that with fact or of the matter because I don't have my normal computer here today. As I mentioned, I'm at Carnegie Mellon in uh, Pittsburgh using a borrowed machine. Uh, otherwise, I would open up Adobe and open up some of my Illustrator files and see if we can open them in uh, Scribe or Ink or GIMP or any of them. Uh, of the three, I would think that Ink would be the most likely candidate. And we can take a look at that if we have time before the before we run out of time today. We can take a look at GIMP or, uh, or Ink and see if they open Illustrator files. It probably says it right on the website. Uh, so Brave looks pretty cool. I can't speak from experience yet, but by the next class, I will be. <laughs> um, so WordPress is just incredibly powerful. And if you... Uh, we have a class that's going on right now. Like we just did the first session last night where we got everybody set up or showed them how to set up both their uh, both their hosting and their domain name. And now we, we, did a, uh, we created a WordPress site last night from scratch, starting with nothing, registering a domain. Well, I had a domain registered, but for everybody else, register the domain and load WordPress and get it online. And we did all that in a two-hour class which normally if I weren't talking through it and explaining it to people, um, I can do myself in about 15 minutes. So I can jump online. I already have my hosting and I already have my domains. So I can jump online and from scratch get a WordPress site up in literally 15 minutes. Then you start making it do all the things you want it to do. And that's pretty much unlimited. That's why I want to at least spend a little time on it because some people don't realize how easy it is and also why uh, it, it really is on a whole different class than Wix or Squarespace, which are some of the hosted platforms for websites. So those are things that you can, you know, sign up and you're up and live immediately, and they're very easy to use, but they don't have near the type of range and capabilities that WordPress does. And right now, you can see this is called a built with trends built with. They track usage on the internet of all different types of software products. And so they're totally, you know, nonpartisan, non-denominational, just uh, science as it comes out, total facts about just tracking data. 
And you can see that with the top 1 million sites on the internet using CMS, uh, WordPress is used for 49% of them. Most of the others you've heard of probably, uh, Drupal, Joomla, WP Engine account for very little. And these are probably all custom systems or systems that are built for corporations or something like that. You can see what the numbers are here. And overall, even without CMS, uh, WordPress accounts for 34% of the sites of all sites on the internet. So one third of, of uh, the sites that you find on the internet well, here you can see 34% of the web, from hobby blogs to the biggest sites online. So even CNN uses WordPress. Uh, the New York Times uses WordPress, the Rolling Stones. So organizations that can afford anything they want and put together any kind of website they want are choosing to use WordPress. It's a really solid platform. And they just got a $300 million injection from Salesforce dot com uh, into automatic to develop a new even better version of wordpress uh, that's going to go next generation with uh, headless websites which is probably more technical than we need to get right now but the point is that it's free and open source and when you talk about being able to do anything that you want with software that's where all these plugins come in so i showed you the numbers before more than 54,000 plugins so if you think of anything that you want to do, these just happen to pop up uh, and they're block enabled that we don't need to talk about what that means. It's just it just refers to the editor, the new editor in WordPress, which most people are bypassing anyway. But these are all different tools that you can use. So for example, search engine optimization. This is uh, Yoast SEO. So search engine optimization means that you set up your site in such a way that uh, if somebody types in your product or your service, your site's going to come up ranked highly. You you really want to be on the home on the first page of Google with results, then you really want to be in the top three or four. Then obviously, ideally, the top. And it's not that hard to do if you know what you're doing. Uh, but it takes a bit of time to learn how to do what you need to do, and Yoast SEO makes it much easier for you. So what you do with that is you install that plugin. And with that plugin installed, it'll rate, and you, you say which words you want to come up on in searches, and it'll rate each one of your pages in the back on the admin side and tell you what to do to make it better for that type of placement. Um, you can with just about anything. So if we did a search, let's say, on calendars, these are all different calendars that you can use, uh, booking calendars, event calendars, and I'm just curious about how many there are. Let's take a look. So 49 pages of results came up with events manager and calendars. And these are all free. Um, anything in here is free and open source. So that means that if you were a programmer or you hired a programmer, let's say that I installed that booking calendar. Uh, I can put that onto my machine. And then when I try to uh, try to use it, suppose it's only got three color options and I can pick which color I want for those events. Then I say, well, wait a minute, I need about 20 color options. Why will it only let me use three? I can have a coder come in and, and with something that simple will probably take about an hour to write the code that would add those other color options uh, because it's open source software. If that were something built into a Microsoft product, like let's say, for example, Microsoft Outlook. You can't go into Microsoft Outlook and to uh, you know say, I want Outlook to do something different than it does now and uh, just change the code and make it do that. So that's one of the, again, the big advantage of free and open source. Uh, what else might we look for? Well, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna check the question panel again. And let me know if there's any other software out there that you're paying for right now that you'd rather not be. Okay, uh, another question did come in. Uh, can this be used with Wix? We use Wix to make our website. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, uh, no, none of these things can be used with Wix. 
And that's the problem with Wix. Uh, a lot of people have been uh, drawn in by the simplicity of Wix. It's software as a service or platform as a service. You can think of Wix as more like Facebook because you don't really control anything on the server. You can't add your own software um, and you're limited to what they give you. And that's why I, I like WordPress and, and WordPress.org, which I need to distinguish as different than WordPress.com. WordPress.com is very similar to Wix, where you use their platform and they give you a certain number of uh, plugins that you can use, and that's it. You can't add your own plugins. With uh, Wix, these aren't even compatible. Uh, I haven't looked at the code Wix is written in. I'm not sure what it's written in, but it's uh, these plugins are designed specifically to work with WordPress, uh, so they won't work with Wix or Squarespace. And you, you can't really migrate a Wix site back to WordPress. You basically have to rebuild it. Um, and somebody said, can you give us the bakersfieldrecycles.com link again? Uh, yes, but that is the link. <laughs> so you already have it, uh, bakersfieldrecycles.com. But let me uh, pull that up. I'll send it out so you can just click on it if you want to. Let me pull that up. Okay, so that's the link and that's the current site I've been using for teaching these classes. But again, I think I'm gonna move some of that over to the California Capital site. And I just uh, resent the link out for bakersfieldrecycles.com. So if you wanna click that link, then you can uh, use that uh, bookmark it and you'll be able to find that again. Um, Oh, I see. The the links I, I sent out before were for the evaluation form. So uh, I got the new, got the original link back out there for you, and you should have that now. Okay. Any other requests for specific types of software to look for? We need some form of AutoCAD to be able to see some plans for job site evaluations. Interesting. I have not uh, not looked that one up before. That's a first request. So let's see what we can find. That's usually the most fun. We get to explore and find new things together. So I'm gonna say open source AutoCAD software. I know it can be very expensive when you buy it. Well, what do you know? Three open source CAD programs, uh, 15 best free plus open source CAD software, 13 best AutoCAD alternatives. Where should we start? Let's try well, here it doesn't say anything about free. This is open source. And what I would normally do is look at these and see if there's one that's consistent across all of them where they all say this one's the, a good choice and start with that. So let's see what they've got here. All right, so among the best known is Autodesk AutoCAD, of course, which is crazy expensive. So BRL CAD is a cross-platform CAD tool at 79. Okay, I'm trying to see if they've got free CAD, real life objects of any side. Libre CAD, CAD program designed to work across Windows, Max, Linux. That's sounding promising. I'm gonna grab this one just for the heck of it and let's see what we can find. All right, so I I don't obviously have the capability of evaluating this in three seconds by looking at the website, but it looks pretty decent uh, for something to try at least. So that's what I would look for. And if you like, I'll just make it convenient for you. I'll send this link out. This is another one I wanna play with now, thank you. See, it's a learning is a two-way street. So I appreciate the, your question. And I'm going to leave this one up along with Brave, and I'm going to check that one out myself after the class because that looks pretty cool. But I don't do enough CAD work to uh, – well, I see this is 2D CAD. I don't know if you need 3D CAD, but you saw what I did. All you do is a search on open source AutoCAD software and see what comes up. Um, 
And as I said before, great places to look, GitHub and SourceForge. So you can go into SourceForge and it tells you all about it. And there's where you can download it. Here are the reviews, 9,000 downloads this week. I, I would trust that number. Those might just be bots, but you can also read reviews and those look pretty solid. So I would uh, I would evaluate them before you go deeply into one because once you're in there, you know it's hard to um, you get used to a certain platform and everybody gets trained on it, and then it makes it harder to shift if you need to. So I'd spend some time up front evaluating a few options and then decide which is best. In fact, one of my undergrad uh, economics professors won a Nobel Prize in economics for that whole concept which I'll, I'll share with you because it's an important concept to understand if you're a business person and making decisions for anything. And that is a term he, he coined as satisficing. And it's a, a, a blend of words for uh, satisfying and sacrificing because what he discovered, uh, and this was back in the, I guess, 60s or 70s when he did all the research and then he got the Nobel Prize later after the research kind of permeated the marketplace. But in American businesses, and I say that because that's the market he studied, people tend to make a decision and choose what solves the problem first rather than comparing alternative possible decisions and seeing what solves the problem the best. And so in a case like this, if I were to say, oh, wait, that's what I need right there, boom, done, and start using it, it might be that if I looked, spent a little time using two or three options and say at the beginning and said, okay, I see the differences between these three. And I think number three is the one we really need. That's going to be your better long-term uh, decision-making process because of, you know, you come out with a better product by investing just a little bit more time in the decision-making and doing some comparison. And uh, one thing I would do just along those lines here, seeing how this all strings out, you can see here that these are categories and subcategories. So there's, Science and Engineering, Mechanical and Civil Engineering, Computer Aided Technologies, CAD, CAM, and uh, CAE before LibreCAD. So I know that that's in here. I'm going to click one up and get a list. So here again, there's LibreCAD, FreeCAD. I don't know what that is. There's some of these others Python CAD, TechniCAD. So I'll send this link out as well to save you some poking around and hunting if you want to look at other options for CAD software. Okay, any other questions or specific requests for types of software? Okay, seeing none, but uh, go ahead and enter those as you like. And as I said, I'm going to leave that one up. So oh, I've got it over here. And we already did that. We can get that out of the way. Okay, well, I could go through all of these different types of plugins with you and show you all the different things they could do, but we could spend days on that. And that's also something you could do just as well at home. Uh, one of the things I do want to show though, just because it's so powerful is uh, WooCommerce. So I'm just going to type in e-commerce here and do a search on that. So I know how to get to it right away. But let's see what else comes up. So this is an example of what I was talking about, where uh, because it's open source, other people can write uh, different, you know, use different things and add to it. So you can see some of these are by, well, Automatic, which is kind of the parent company now for WordPress, took over WooCommerce not long ago. So it's become the standard even with Automatic that a lot of other people have written additional add-ons for it. And you can use those add-ons for anything that you like. So here, for example, is a WooCommerce menu cart that automatically displays the shopping cart in your menu bar, works with WooCommerce, WP eCommerce, EDD, eShop, to go shop. So this is a third-party program, but I can add it to my WooCommerce installation. And excuse me, and it'll add these features for me. If there were another feature that I wanted to use for something, then I can add that feature that somebody else might have written. 
Um, so lots of options. DHL for WooCommerce. So the official DHL for WooCommerce plugin allows you to automate your e-commerce order processing covering shipping services from DHL e-commerce globally. So you can see even somebody like DHL, and I want to make sure that's by DHL. Let's make sure it looks like it. Yeah, it says by DHL. Um, and DHL's official extension for WooCommerce. So it looks like what you can do is put this extension in and automatically connect it with your DHL account. So if you're selling physical products and you somebody places an order, it would automatically enter that shipping information. And well, you can see what it does, uh, creates the label and does everything else, preferred delivery options, customization. Now this one looks like different access credentials. Oh, so they also have packets for different countries as well. So that gives you some idea of how extensive uh, WooCommerce can be. And that's where we even just typed in e-commerce. If we put in WooCommerce specifically, so here you can use it with Stripe, Germanized version, uh, supercharge probably adds, well, it says it's add more, so that adds more than 100 modules uh, to WooCommerce. Product filters, advanced shipment tracking. Let's just see how many there are. Now, this is just for WooCommerce. So we've also got, it looks like 49 pages, at least showing here, that come up with WooCommerce options. Now, I don't know how closely they might not match as well when you get deeper in that you can see here through just the first three pages, these are all directly WooCommerce add-ons. So you can automate your entire e-commerce system uh, with cheap hosting. You can pay you know, five or $10 a month and have a website up where you can add all of this software completely for free and be able to operate an online business with practically zero cost. Uh, you can do lots of different things with that too. We have a class on on monetizing websites and that's where we go into all the different things from being an Amazon affiliate to creating online content where people pay to subscribe. You can do an online newsletter. Uh, there's dozens of ways to turn a website into a money generating platform and often multiple uh, approaches to that. So your main purpose might be Let's say you have a photography website. You can put up your website all about photography and then do reviews on different cameras or um, different cards or different features or filters or components or accessories for cameras. And then when you do that, you write an honest review about what you think about it, compare them to a few others, but links that your Amazon affiliate account where people can click through and buy it if they want to. And if they do, then you get a, uh, commission for that. Uh, you can sign up with something like Rakuten and you can sell products from Macy's and Home Depot and Nordstrom and just about everybody else. So if somebody comes to your website to buy them, uh, they do direct shipping so you don't have to deal with all that, but you get paid every time somebody makes a purchase through your site. Same thing with uh, job boards. You can team up with uh, something like uh, Oh, I can't remember the name of the, the big one now, but there are a lot of different job board networks out there and they have affiliate programs, including like um, oh, Career Builder. So there's Career Builder and there's, uh, shoot, I can't think of the big network. And But anyway, it, if you just do a search on that, you'll find it. And they've got, you can sign up to where you can post jobs as well. So say you have a photography shop, uh, website, you can do your reviews about products and have a list of the products that you recommend where if somebody clicks, you get a commission from Amazon. Then you can also have a newsletter that people subscribe to. So you keep building your list, make that free. Then you can have different levels of membership if you want to, where you're putting more detailed content behind a price wall kind of like the New York Times or Washington Post do where, or the Sacramento Bee where you can read a certain amount of articles for free and then you pay if you want to read more than that. Uh, but lots of different ways that you can do it. And then you could have uh, another column 
where you have, say, job coming in, and those jobs are all photography jobs. But if somebody clicks on one, you get a commission. And I used to have dozens of those uh, job boards up, but they were uh, just a lot to keep an eye on every day and keep them up to date. But I was uh, making quite a bit of money of just coming in automatically every month from people that are going in and clicking on links for jobs. But I don't want to get too far off track with that. And all of those things that I mentioned are free. So I don't see any other uh, questions coming in. And I think we've covered the, the general gist of it. And the concept again is that free software can be um, can be used for to replace anything you're currently paying for, and it is safer. So let me see. I do have another question coming in. We've got a thank you and another one. Oh, that's nice to see. Love this training! Triple exclamation mark. Can you please tell me how to get other training with you? I'm new to this type of uh, information and want to learn more. Uh, yes, I'm actually glad you asked that question. That sounds like a commercial. Uh, because if you go to California Capital, uh, here we go. They've got workshops and events here. And uh, they've got some tremendous programs going on. And there's uh, right now, I'm in the middle of a web development series that actually just kicked off last night. Now, that one is a paid class. Um, I don't remember the price for it because it's paid to to uh, California Capital, not to me. But I'm I'm teaching the class, and it's uh, because there is a fee. They've also allocated uh, some time for me and a budget, so I can spend as much one-on-one -on -one time as needed with people to get them from zero. So these are people again. We're doing this as websites, and we're um, starting from scratch with everybody. And I'm walking them through and providing as much time one-on-one -on -one as needed to have them with a website that's up, running, and functional by the time the series is over. So they'll have their website up and know how to manage everything on it themselves and not have to pay anybody to do it. So uh, that's what that class is about. But you can see that California Capital actually has a lot of great classes that I'm not teaching as well. So I'd suggest familiarizing yourself with that. And um, I don't know why. Probably because it's uh, been made private because it's a paid class, but I'm not sure why mine aren't uh, showing in here. But we just started uh, last night with that one. So if you contact Sophia, and you can see too, we've got the training evaluation form here. If you need to download that, and I'm sorry, not Sophia, Sarah. Sarah is the the new Sophia. Sophia is still there. She's great. She's doing good work and all. But Sarah came on as well, and she's working with this program. Um, so if you need her information, you all have my contact information. Feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, sometimes I'm tied up for a bit, but I will get back to you. And if you need Sarah's contact info because you'd like to sign up for the other class that I'm teaching, that one's going for nine sessions. And we just did the first session last night, and that was the fundamentals of registering a domain and getting hosting. So you wouldn't be behind at all. Uh, and it was recorded, so we can even provide that recording for you to catch up pretty quickly. But other than that, let me see what else we have here. Okay. Okay, so uh, a request here. I'm going to read this quietly to see which part of it I should read publicly. So the first part is please raise send Sarah's info in your email. Um, we'll do. You'll actually get an email from me when the webinar closes. And the you should have gotten something when uh, probably from Bob at themobiusnetwork.com, but I'll uh, I'll send out my current that one works, but I've got better. Okay, and then I see the question is about trying to increase traffic. Okay. Uh, yes to that question. So. So the person who said, please resend Sarah's info and email, and I have a personal question trying to increase traffic, um, and I, I won't read the rest just because it's uh, nothing embarrassing or anything, but also nothing for the whole class to need to hear. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk with you more and uh, help you get that website transferred from Wix to WordPress. 
And then another, uh, thank you, Bob, your classes are always great. Well, thank you because they wouldn't happen without great students like you, Trina. And I appreciate your, your attendance here and uh, hope you enjoyed the web, the web class last night that you were also in. Okay, I'm uh, not seeing any other questions come in. I'll, I will uh, provide my email again and I'll put that in the chat box too. So, All right, let me make sure I didn't mistype my own email here. So bob.hollis at mobiusintelligentsystems.com. Okay, so I just sent my uh, email out. Feel free to contact me. I'll be in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and Washington, DC through October 7th. And then I will be back in my home uh, in the mountains just west of Tahoe, just in time for the beautiful fall weather. So looking forward to get back to California. Um, there's a couple more thank yous. Again, thank you all. And usually we have, a, a, I know I have a couple more coming up. We just did another free one a little while back for website security. And now that one was a, a free class that anybody could attend, a two hour workshop. And then we, uh, the other one is the paid class. That's the web development series where everybody's going to walk out with their own website done up and running. And then this one was the free and open source. And I think we've got another one on the calendar that's also free. It might be e-commerce. Or no, we did that one as well. Uh, but we've got recordings available. So I'm happy to provide those too. And uh, hopefully I can connect with Sarah here sometime soon and we'll get some more on the books because I enjoy them myself. So thank you again, everybody. Uh, you've got my email. If any other questions come to mind after we're done, don't hesitate to get in touch. And other than that, happy hacking. Bye-bye.